uh, as I went through the American educational system was when the teacher said, you know, well, who discovered America? And being Native American, you know, I have a particular understanding of who discovered America. And when Columbus uh, was the name that was brought forward, then I said, well, okay, something's wrong with this picture. There's a serious blind spot. And so as a youngster, I already knew at that point that uh, I'm, going, I'm going to have to be dealing with these kinds of blind spots as I move through the education system. You know, when I started first grade, I didn't speak English at all. And, um, and so my first language is Maliseet. And I felt really lost and alienated, you know, on that very first day of class. And, um, and so one of the things I did recognize is that I was put in a position where everything that I knew to be true and right with the world was rendered meaningless and mute in this new context. And so for me, I think that that's where, okay, how do I make that kind of adjustment? And I couldn't do it myself. And so my mother was uh, really important in uh, helping me navigate those early years uh, and in elementary school. And so there were these, you know, I do remember these uh, anxious evenings where I'm trying to learn English, to read and write and all that. And, you know, there, my mother was frustrated. I was frustrated. And so at some point, you know, she would just kind of close the notebooks and push them aside. And then she would start telling me stories about, you know, back home, uh, back on the reservation. And, uh, and then that would be in Maliseet. And then she would start drawing pictures. And uh, I remember one story about a cabin and there was a, uh, a, a canoe out in the lake. And then there were these hills and there was like a moon coming up over the, uh, from between the hills. And I just remember that so vividly. Uh, and that's what sparked my interest in, you know, art. And so I thought, wow, I want to be able to draw just like mom. And so that was, was pretty much what guided me in terms of how I found my own form of expression. And so how do I make sense of the alienation I was, you know, dealing with as a youngster? In some ways, it was to tell stories through art. My crayons, you know, were the medium by which I could, you know, internalize these kinds of uh, conflicts, but also find a way uh, to move forward. And so drawing became a way of, you know, alternative storytelling. How do I make sense of this world? How do I bring something back that, you know, I could then share and then tell that story with others? One of the things that I recognize going through my respective disciplines, whether it's fine arts and architecture as well as anthropology, uh, for me, none of them are mutually exclusive, that they all inform one another in, in very important ways. And one of the things that I did recognize is that that early commitment to drawing and storytelling uh, was a way of reaching people I don't even know. And uh, how do we include people in conversations uh, on a, uh, a level where they don't even meet me, but they can look at the cartoons or look at the artwork and understand where I'm coming from, what kind of story I'm trying to share with them. And, and so for me, this is where uh, I continue to produce drawings, paintings, as well as cartoons uh, as that kind of means of communication, inviting people I don't even know to participate in that storytelling. One of the most important things that I do in terms of my own research and my uh, professional uh, responsibilities is to help revitalize indigenous languages. And one of the things that uh, I recognize, again, this is one of those blind spots that you know we see in disciplines. Often when you read the literature in uh, linguistics about language documentation and revitalization, they have a tendency to focus on the code, the language itself. And so for me, one of the things that I recognize is when we, when I'm with uh, community elders and I'm listening to them use their language, it's poetry, it's music, it's art, it is just so beautiful. And so what really makes it beautiful is not the code itself, it's the relationships. 
And so for me, one of the things that I'm really interested in is how does my artwork create those kinds of relationships? And so if we can come together and have a conversation about the cartoon or share the experiences about the installation pieces, then we're creating these worlds. And some of the most innovative work that's being done in linguistic anthropology and language revitalization is along the lines of world making. And so we're not documenting the language as much as we're creating new worlds. And so for me, that's what artwork does. It allows us to come together and co-create these new worlds. Yeah. When I was uh, doing my field work back in the mid 90s, uh, in, I was helping the Maliseet language teacher at Maso School back at Tobik First Nation uh, in creating content for you know, language instruction and practice. So we created a uh, Maliseet prayer of thanksgiving. And uh, the, the, it's a complicated process, but the, the germ was how do we get students to understand and use the language in a way that you know, reintegrates the landscape, spirituality, and the language so that it's not just about the code, it's about our relationships to our ancestral lands. And so for me, that was the project. When I returned to finish up my dissertation, um, one of the things that I'd wanted to do was I wanted to bring that sensibility with me. And so I turned that prior project into an installation piece. I started doing the sketches uh, for what it might look like if I created the prayer uh, in the round. And so what happened then was the early sketches identified 12 stanzas of the prayer and I arranged them in a circle. And so the first prayer, the line of the prayer, you give thanks to the sun. And so because we are Wabanaki, uh, we are the people of the dawn is the way that's often been translated. Uh, but Wabanaki comes from the Maliseet word Chquabin, which is the first light of dawn. And what's really great about this is that it's not really a noun like in a ray of light as much as a process. And so it's dawning is more of an appropriate way to describe that particular expression. So the word is chquabin. Once you realize that it's dawn, you've already been in the process of the dawn. And so for me, it's really important that uh, we understand where that comes from and how that transforms our understanding of Wabanaki, the people of the dawn. And so for me, one thing I wanted to do was the first line of the prayer, you face east and you give thanks to the sun. And then you go clockwise uh, for all 12 stanzas. And so that's, that was a conception. Bad. Cosmogony is about world making. Cosmology is understanding what's already out there. And so you can talk about you know, cosmology and how things were produced, but it's not the same sensibility. And so the prayer, I wanted the prayer to have that quality. And so it took years for me to start developing what that was going to look like. And when I was a, uh, uh, an ass assistant professor and then became associate at uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, this is when I created the first draft. And the prayer um, was on three foot by seven foot panels, 12 of them, and they were arrayed in a circle. And, uh, and again, it was directional. The first prayer was facing east. And then, you know, uh, and one of the things that I wanted to do was create that sense of primordial time, Maliseet ancestral time. And so part of the prayer was to re-present or emerge, immerse people in ancestral time. And so I took a story from our oral traditions about the Tobik rock. And I said, you are now standing on the Tobik rock and you are saying the prayer. And so what you do is then become immersed in Maliseet ancestral time and sacred space. And so I wanted that to be part of the experience. Now, as an artist, I recognize that you know, what I do and how I produce it 
and when I what I intend for the viewer uh, to experience may not align with what the viewer actually experiences. And so being an anthropologist, I decided that th this installation piece is what I would describe as experiential ethnography. It's not just about reading it, it's about experiencing it. And so how do I get somebody to experience Maliseet worlds? Not to understand it cognitively, but to understand it emotionally. And so this is why the installation piece was so important. And so three foot by seven foot panels, and it reproduced primordial space. It takes place at Schwaben, the first light of dawn. Not when the sun is appearing over the horizon, but when it starts to glow. And so superimposed on that 360 degree landscape uh, are depictions of each prayer stanza itself. And then I have the text, I have directional marker, and I have a logo uh, gram of uh, uh, Tobik First Nation, and I also have a small square traditional, you know, birch bark, you know, etching. And so all of this was used to create that sense of malice, space, time, language. And so I, you know, had that first draft, you know, as a public, you know, uh, uh, presentation. And so during the opening, when this was being viewed, um, I was watching people walk in and out of the installation piece, and there were a lot of thoughtful looks and. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, how, how are people receiving this? And a colleague of mine from geography, you know, he was in there for the longest time. And, and then he came out and came up to me and he says, Bernie, when I'm in that space, I feel pure joy. And so for me, that's the goal of the artwork. How do we share that experience and celebrate what we can all share as we imagine possible worlds? Now in conversations with uh, members of the community to find a way that I can, <laughs> okay, these things are big, three feet by seven feet. Uh, how do I ship them across country so that I can then uh, allow the community members to, you know, experience the, uh, the space. One of the things that I hope to um, accomplish with the, the, the project is that it becomes a permanent, it has a permanent presence someplace in our ancestral land. And so right now, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm work, actually working on the final version. So it's the draft version that had the first public viewing in Milwaukee. Uh, and I'm currently working on the finished version. And so uh, hopefully by sometime towards winter term one, towards the end of winter term one, I'll have a public showing so that here at UBC. It's one of these projects of love that you never really finish. Uh, and, and I think that for me, as I hear more about how people are responding to, uh, to the installation piece, uh, for me, it gives me more encouragement that, you know, now is the time to really pull it all together. And so as a working draft, it was really effective. Uh, and so now I get to really uh, finish the project the way I want to see it done. I think that all of us are going to bring to any art piece, whether it's written, whether it's a uh, physical object, or whether it's a space that we all experience, we're going to bring our own experiences to our first impression. Uh, the real question then would be, how can the artist provide enough cues to the observer or the experiencer uh, to interpret it in ways that are expected to them. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, I recognize is that, you know, when we think in terms of uh, Western temporalities, there's the past, there's the present, and there's the future, and there's usually a timeline and there's a direction. And so <clears throat> there is uh, very good reasons why uh, we lean on that particular model for our daily 
you know, activities and experiences. Uh, but at the same time, it does, if we don't critically examine that kind of temporality, it leads us to the kinds of blind spots about how we can really engage the past in meaningful ways. And so this, again, you know, really does bring in the work I do with the language. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that I recognize is, you know, well, you know, we, we call it the Willistook River. And, uh, and so that's really significant. Instead of you know, understanding that it was called the St. John River, but the Maliseet call it the Willistook River, then it asks questions. Was St. John ever in New Brunswick? No. You know, so why is it called the St. John River? But if we call it the Willistook River, and we understand what that means, the peaceful river, then it changes things. But more importantly, what it does also do is it describes a relationship. It says, we're people of the Willistook River, Willistook So our preferred ethnonym is not Maliseet, it's Willistook people of the beautiful river. And that changes fundamentally our relationship to the river. And so once we provide those cues, it allows somebody else with a different experience to say, I need to think about this differently. And so if we think about ancestral voices, then they're not voices in the past. They're with us today and we carry them forward. And so you break down the Western temporalities so that it provides a much more meaningful relational uh, commitment to who we are and all our relations. For me, I think, again, it's the invitation. And, you know, we, we can recognize that there are a lot of angry artists out there. And so, and they have good reasons to be angry. And their artwork can evoke that kind of anger. And so I can look at those pieces and I can say, well, okay, yeah. This, this person's really angry about this or that. And, uh, and so, in some ways, the work assaults you. And so you can't ignore it. And that's the effect that these artists would like to have with their artwork. But for me, does that really create a community of caring? And so, for me, I want to create that community of caring. You know, and, and this is where if I can create pieces that invite conversation, then the most important cue is that let's work together. Not let's be angry together, but let's work together. And so as Native peoples, you know, we've got a lot to be angry about. And I think that, uh, and so there are plenty of other academics, community members that can express that kind of anger, that kind of trauma, uh, much more effectively than I can. For me, what's most important is that we do not forget those particular experiences, but what we need to do is work together moving forward. For me, my artwork is not just for indigenous peoples, it's for everybody. And so one of the things that we talk about often here at UBC in particular uh, is, well, British Columbia and Canada as well, is truth and reconciliation. And one of the things that I recognize is that too often when we use these expressions that we find ourselves, oh, we're all on the same page here. And for me, this is where we have to challenge that notion. Uh, because one of the things that I recognize is in any kind of relationship of abuse, it's not just the abused that needs healing. It's the abuser that also needs healing. And this colonial state, you know, there is still that kind of, you know, systemic violence that is, you know, uh, still in our institutions. And so we need to recognize that, you know, uh, our larger Canadian society also needs healing. And a lot of people don't want to admit they need that. And so how do we come to the same table? How do we come to the same, you know, conversation so that we both understand healing is going to be a project for both of us? One of the things that I really do appreciate about, uh, <clears throat> you know, how my personal experience going through the education system uh, and dealing with, well, you know, the blind spots. 
uh, and uh, and you know right from day one, first grade, all the way to my PhD. Uh, and so you know during my uh, PhD progress, I would find other Native Americans in the same table and we're talking about what's going on in sociology, what's going on in English, what's going on in uh, the Diff School, uh, what's going on in anthropology. And so we're sitting there, oh God, can you believe this is going on in all our different classes? And so there's a shared experience of frustration that, okay, there's a serious blind spot here. But as we're talking about that, towards the end of the conversation, we're all laughing. You know, and, and so this is what that kind of laughter allows us to understand uh, and laugh at the absurdities. Mm -hmm. And so the absurdities, the ironies, uh, for me, this is the point of the comics. How do I identify the ironies and the absurdities so that we can all laugh at that? Mm -hmm. If we can laugh together at the absurdities and ironies, then we can work together to fix it. What is my vision? <laughs> you know, it's uh, you know the, the 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 question is tricky in that it's framed in such a way that um, there's an expectation of a particular kind of vision, and uh, and I would describe my vision of cosmogony uh, in the same way I describe you know my work, and. Um, you know, people often ask, you know, before you start a painting, you know, how do you imagine it? And, and I think that's really the key, is that there is an idea uh, that, or a vision that I have that I want to bring into being. And with my, you know, uh, training in you know, fine arts, it's a Western model of, you know, fine arts academic, you know, training. Uh, and then getting a master's degree in architecture, uh, and then getting a PhD in anthropology. All of these skill sets, you know, serve the vision. And so I didn't go into art to be an artist. Well, actually, I lie. I was going to retire at 35 because I was going to be a famous artist. Um, that didn't happen. Okay, uh, and then I went into architecture. Do I want to create all these, you know, buildings? Uh, yes, I did, but at the same time, uh, I recognized there was more for me. And so, what got me into anthropology were stories. And so, I originally went into anthropology uh, to you know, see how our oral traditions were being passed on from one generation to the next. You know, how does that work? And, um, and so for me, one of the things that I recognized early on in the research was that they were not being passed on from one generation to the next. And I think this is where, for me, if vision is the word you want to use, of a particular kind of cosmogony of world making, uh, and it began to crystallize when I recognized how important it was to revitalize the language and reinscribe the language, the landscape, and the stories uh, as an integrated, you know, cultural, you know, matrix. And so it's about being rather than these kinds of, you know, distinct sort of academic uh, subjects. And so it was about being in the world. And so for me, how do I they then envision that? And so using all my skills, I was able to kind of imagine what I'm going to do. Okay, so going back to the painting. Okay, so uh, in my office here at UBC, I have a, uh, a triptych. Uh, they're about maybe three feet wide and maybe five feet tall, three paintings. Uh, and um, they're not a typical kind of painting. Uh, they're more constructions. And so the way to describe it is that the triptych, the themes are language death, language maintenance, and language revitalization. And it's about the Maliseet language. And so while I was working on my, the monograph, defying Maliseet language death, I recognize that writing about Maliseet language death 
didn't capture the emotive aspect of the trauma of what happens when you lose your language. And so for me, these kinds of motions were not adequate to capture that. And so for me, it was like, there's another way to imagine how to share this experience with others, not just with words. And I know that, you know, that's not my greatest skill set is words. And so painting is something I can do. And so, but do I want to put a brush to a canvas? No, what I did was I tore the canvas apart. And, uh, and I had all these different pieces and I slapped paint onto the canvas and I put all these torn pieces of canvas and, you know, buckets of paint and all, and then had that all kind of spread out over the uh, uh, basement floor. And, uh, and then the construction period starts. And so I have an idea of what it's going to look like. And so as I go through the process, it approximates what that vision is going to be. And so the final piece itself is something that, you know, yeah, okay, that's as close as I can get to what I had imagined. And so it is about that kind of world making that, you know, it's, it's not about a finished product as much as it is about the process. And so the painting itself, the triptych, uh, becomes a marker of a particular point in that process. In terms of a cosmogony, how I imagine the world to be, uh, you know, for me, I think that uh, here I am right now at uh, UBC, Point Grey. This is the traditional uh, ancestral unceded territories of the Hunkaminum um, um, speaking Musqueam people. And I want to know something of their ancestral world. And so I'm listening to the sound of the wind in these cedars because it's a different sound I hear back home at Tobik. Uh, and, you know, we have the river that kind of uh, sloshes by the, uh, the house back at Tobik, but here I've got the Salish Sea. And so there's a different quality, the smells, the sounds, the textures. And so that's something I want to understand. How do the Musqueam know this land? And so if all of us can take the time to visit that, that's part of the cosmogony building. The way the story is told, the reason why Maliseet is used to describe uh, my community is because when the settlers asked, you know, who are those people living upriver? Mm -hmm. And so the Mi'kmaq would say, oh, those are the Maliseets. Mm -hmm. And the impression is that the Maliseet didn't speak Mi'kmaq mm -hmm. properly. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we got stuck with Maliseet. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, unfortunately, it becomes part of the historical record, and that's something we have to grapple with. Uh, but right now, I'm happy to say that we had this amazing language uh, summit at Tobik First Nation this past June, and they had a language immersion uh, meeting, a gathering uh, in uh, Fredericton, uh, also in June. And a lot of the youngsters are not using the word Maliseet, they're using the words Wulastugwe. And so for me, that's a real indication that the younger generation are seeing that they can imagine themselves as Wulastugwe, not Maliseet. And so they're kind of throwing off that kind of colonial cloak and starting to reassert their own sovereignty about who they are. And so I'm really excited about what the younger generation is going to do. I think we're at a moment where, you know, again, it goes back to what is the larger political climate. And truth and reconciliation is one of those moments where there's greater awareness of the historical circumstances. And there's also an awareness of responsibilities that have to be addressed. I think that that also allows for particular kinds of imaginings of possible worlds. And so for me, that's really key, uh, is now we're at a moment where, you know, settler society is going to be supportive of indigenous projects of world making. And I'm excited about that. There, there are going to be a lot of challenges ahead of us, uh, but I think that the energy and the imagination 
of the younger generations working with our elders is going to be something that's going to be mutually beneficial and productive. Mm -hmm. And as I say, you know, the youngsters are using Willistugui, and I'm excited about that. That's, a, that's one of those kinds of, let's say, conceptual shifts that a generation can contribute to, you know, how we can maintain our ancestral voices. When you, if, you, if you were to come to the office and you saw the triptych, you could see that the first panel is language death, the second one is language maintenance, and the third one is language revitalization. So I've already revealed to you that I'm an optimist. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, uh, it's that kind of uh, engagement and that kind of vision uh, that's going to contribute to how we can all transform our own understandings and practices for a better world. Because we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. I tell students on the first day of class, I love my job. Because one of the things that I recognize is in a classroom, let's say that I've got a class of 45 students, and I recognize that you know, there are going to be some students that you know, they just take it because they need a kind of credit or requirement. I understand that, I get that. I remember when I was an undergraduate, and so I had a, you know, like everybody, you know, I had a pecking order. This one gets all my attention. This one I can get away with. And so I recognize I'm going to have those students in my class. But they present a challenge, saying, okay, how can I get them to take interest in what I have to say. And so it is about, the classroom for me is not about disseminating information. It's about world making. How do we together imagine what I may have to offer in terms of knowledge? How do we work together towards transformative actions? And so for me, that's the opportunity. And, and in the Reward is how I see students take, it doesn't have to be everything, some of the ideas that I present in class and run with it. That somehow it transforms them and allows them to see how they can transform the world. And so for me, that's what I bring to the classroom. And when I see students with their creative projects, that's what I'm excited about. That's what makes me optimistic. Yeah, I'll share a delightful experience. Well, it didn't start out delightful, I can tell you that. I was at the dentist's office. Okay, and so I'm, <laughs> I'm returning from the dentist's office. And, uh, and so I'm not in a good mood. And uh, it wasn't much pain, but I'm not in a good mood. And so I've got the radio on the car on CBC, and they've got this kind of classical music hour. And so, you know, I'll, I'll say right now, I love classical music. I'm never giving it up. Uh, and so I often wonder, when I'm listening to Beethoven, what, what did he hear up here? Is it analogous to what I see when I'm thinking about artwork? And so when I'm finished with a piece and he writes it out, is it as a close approximation as he can to what he hears up here. And then in the actual performance of the piece, you know, how close is it? And so for me, those are the kind of intriguing questions I ask about classical music, you know, Western art, all kinds of art. You know, what, what did the artist imagine? Because they wanted to share something. And how closely does the product allow us to share that vision. Okay, so here I am, returning from the dentist's office, and I'm stuck at a stoplight. I'm looking up towards a hill at the stoplight, and then all of a sudden on the radio, there's this really aggressive chord played by a cellist. I said, whoa, and then I can hear a melody in the first few measures, and I'm saying, that sounds familiar. And, uh, and then next thing you know, I hear this kind of rattle. And, and then I hear this voice. 
I know that voice. That sound, voice sounds familiar. And I'm listening to the song. And, and sure enough, uh, it's a friend of mine, Jeremy Dutcher. And he is trained in opera. He took Maliseet songs from wax cylinders and he's reinterpreted them. And so these are like 19th century, early 20th century recordings. And so he's brought those ancestral voices to today. And in one of them in particular, he sings a duet with the wax cylinder. And so here you have this kind of archival ancestral voice, somebody that's trained in classical opera and interpreting these in a very new way. And so how does he imagine that? And so for me, that's what is exciting. And so now he's celebrated across the globe for that kind of innovation. I mean, he won the Juno Prize for best album for that you know, particular work. But the other thing is that now people get to hear Maliseet around the world. And so the real important difference here, and I recognize this in the work that I was doing early on, if you want to identify what is the most important contributing factor to the demise of a language, it's loss of prestige. There's a stigma attached to using that language. And so how do we then turn that around and bring prestige to the language? And Jeremy Dutcher is doing that. And so it's the imagination and the audacity to do something creative uh, that gives me hope. Yeah, the term I use for that is alternative vitalities. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's the life of the object. Mm -hmm. And so how does it transform with each different use, each different context? And, and so for me, that, that's part of the work of language revitalization is how do we recognize that it's not just the code, but it's all forms of the code that become important. And so language life, yes, it could be about how we use it in the everyday, but it's also how we use it in these other new forms, whether it's like, uh, uh, you know, uh, music or, you know, art installation pieces. And so for me, those alternative vitalities contribute to the, uh, the term I like to use is the emergent vitality of language. Mm -hmm. And so all languages continue to change. And so instead of focusing on the past, I focus on what we can do in the present as we imagine language futures. And I think for me, recognizing that, you know, language is a community process. It's not individual. Even when we think to ourselves, you know, we're still engaged in a larger conversation. And uh, because there are previous conversations that led to that particular thought that you had. Oh, what can I do about this? And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's already, other conversations are implicated in it. And so for me, that's what's exciting about, you know, thinking in this way. It's about those emergent vitalities, how things are going to emerge from all the interactions we have. And again, this is where, you know, uh, one of the expressions I like to use is, you know, in Jeremy Dutcher's work in particular, um, when, when we talk about our languages, it doesn't matter which language it is, you know, we're in some ways exercising uh, the echoes of time immemorial. And so the stories go way back to time immemorial. And so Western time, you know, well, okay, that, that was a long time ago. Uh, but for, you know, a lot of indigenous peoples, no, and time immemorial's here right now. And that's an important consideration because that means that those voices are not in the past, they're with us. And I think this is what Jeremy Dutcher is doing, you know, with the, with the uh, uh, duet that he, you know, sings with the wax cylinder and uh, the voice on the wax cylinder. And so it, it kind of collapses those Western temporalities. So time immemorial is actually in the present and it's moving forward into the future. And that's what I'm excited about. And this is kind of, all languages can do that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and if we can all work together on that kind of sense of temporality, 
then we have a mutual future together. Yeah, gizelmo. In Maosi, that means I love you. So I think we all have those words. And so it's not just a word, it's a relationship. You know, it, it's a sound that triggers particular kinds of emotions and a, you know, a commitment to a relationship. And so our languages are all, you know, designed to do that. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, just paying attention to what those relationships are uh, is extremely important. You know, one of my favorite words is schadenfreude. <laughs> And so we may not have a word for it in English, but we know what it means. Mm -hmm. and, and so it is about a, <clears throat> a, a state of being. Schadenfreude is a state of being. And so uh, uh, you just have to use more words to be able to capture what the essence of that state of being is. And the word I used earlier, chquabin, uh, would be one of those words. And so to say dawn, it's incomplete. Uh, to say dawning, uh, then it allows you an approximation of what that might be. But if you stand in the middle of the installation piece, the prayer piece, then you have a better experience of what chquabin might be. Mm -hmm. How do you, or how do I, um, address other people's experiences and invite them so that they can approximate what I'm trying to convey. And, and I think that you know, our conversation has, all, has been about this for the last hour or so. And you know, you, we're using English, and I'm dropping a few uh, malice words into the conversation, uh, but we're all able to you know, triangulate the kinds of understandings. And so we're doing that work of collaborative world building world making and that's what makes it possible that you know a person can approach the installation piece from a particular standpoint and open themselves up and if they're receptive then they're going to experience something that I hope is close to what I had hoped to share. One of the things that I recognize is that uh, when I was in architecture it goes back to, you know, you know, well, there's a blind spot here. And so it was early on in my design projects that I recognized I was building with the landscape, not building on the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so I recognized that there's a relationship between the built environment and the landscape that this building or this you know, construction was going to uh, occupy. And so I learned a lot of important lessons and skills in architecture. Uh, one of them, you know, I was always terrible at math. Okay, now I'm going to be an architect. Ooh, well, maybe structural engineering is something I need to know about. And so I did the structural courses, we had to do all the equations, all the physics, we had to do the diagrams, and, uh, and I was saying, there, yeah, 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 I got this, I got this, I got this. And then the final project was, well, you got to put it all together now. And so that's when I saw the aesthetics in math. I said, oh, that's how it works. And so for me, uh, that's it's almost as though architecture just kind of tapped into something I was already sensitive to. And I was able to then say, okay, that's how math works. And I can, I can see the beauty of why this is important. And so it wasn't just the aesthetic sort of, okay, this is the building, but it's also in the structure itself. How do you make a beautiful building throughout? The process, and so for me, that, that that's where you know architecture became one of those important lessons. 
Uh, the other thing about architecture is it also allowed me uh, to conceive of how I use different materials in my installation pieces. And so I can better say, well, okay, this is going to be too heavy, it's not going to work, I'm going to, I'm going to have to do something else. Uh, and it allows me particular kinds of licenses, if you will, to rethink the parameters of what constitutes a visual art piece. For example, you know, we have a print over there and it's, you know, behind glass, it's in a frame. My installation piece, no frame, no glass. And so it's hanging from three pieces of wood. And, uh, and it's, uh, and I, th there's a lattice of, um, you know, twine that the canvas hangs on. And all the canvas, the, the, the canvas itself is, you know, kind of structured. And again, it's because of my architectural training that I'm able to conceptualize these more spatial orientations and constructions. Well, there's, there's a, uh, a couple of projects that, you know, like, the the first draft of the prayer I want to finish that there's a another uh, a, a graphic novel uh, project that I'm working on that I want to finish um, I have to do the translation in Maliseet uh, it turns out that in the kind of graphic novel form you've got the speech bubbles yeah. and so I did it in English first and I put the text in the speech bubbles okay so Maliseet or Wulastugwe is a uh, <clears throat> polysynthetic language. And so you might have a verb stem, but then you have multiple uh, prefixes and suffixes. And sometimes a single word can turn into a, a sentence. And so that screwed up all my speech bubbles. And so now I have to go back and you know, figure out, okay, how do I redesign this so that the malice can fit in the speech bubbles. So that's what I'm working on now. But the most important thing about the graphic novel is I'm trying to break the mold of the graphic novel. Okay, so you buy a graphic novel and <clears throat> it's a graphic novel because it has hard covers. Otherwise, it's a comic book, you know? And so, <laughs> so you open it up and then you turn page by page. The way I've designed it is that it's a folding book. And so it's one piece of paper, and then page one, you have to connect to page 20. And then what you do is it's active reading, and you create Mouse Eat Sacred Space in Mouse Eat Sacred Time. And so it then brings back that aspect of how do we imagine new worlds. So reading can be really passive. Yeah, I'm going to read the story. Yeah, it was really great. Oh, by the way, I like the illustrations. Uh, and so, you know, th this is how we read graphic novels. And so you fold it up and put it away. What I'm going to do is challenge the reader to create Mouse Eat Worlds. Mm -hmm. So as you read it, you can, you know, read it page by page. Or if you're really adventurous, you can create mouse eat worlds by connecting page one to page 20 and sit in the middle. And you'll be in mouse eat sacred space. Wow, I'm looking forward to this uh, completion. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been a work for a few years. Wow. So, yeah, I think, you know, for me, world making is that aspect of recognizing that, you know, we do live in in this particular world, in the present, uh, but we're also gifted with imperfect senses. That, you know, we have only a particular kind of uh, visual range, uh, and our brain also has a tendency to block out, you know, distractions. What, we're, what our brain does is allow us to focus on the immediate context, but our ears hear so much more uh, and even our vision if we look at one item for a while and then we look at some plate cells you know like a blank wall then all of a sudden you know you see an imprint uh, or the kind of visual image so this is how complex our worlds are and our senses do their best to help us make sense of that world but our brains allow us to fill in the blanks and so world making is about that aspect of well this is a world I live in uh, it w existed before I existed uh, but now how do I imagine the world moving forward and so for me this goes back to the stories we all 
love stories. And, uh, and so some of the stories are, you know, these kind of collaborative processes of world making. Even if somebody is reading a story to you, it's still that aspect of a participatory story event. And in that story event, your brain, together with others, is creating that new world. And so today, after this conversation, the world's going to look different to you. We've already transformed the world in meaningful ways. And so for me, world making is about doing just that, is to have these conversations, imagine possible worlds, so that we can, you know, continue the transformation process. And one of the things that I do in my writing about language revitalization is that I have a tendency not to, towards the end of the essay, these academics, you know, you got to write a conclusion. Okay, so it's, what, two paragraphs, three paragraphs, depending on what you're doing, and you have to say, conclusion. And so I don't do that. And I say, in the beginning. And so the idea is that it doesn't stop here. And so for me, the conversations have to go on. We don't just, you know, say, put a period at the end and it's done. And so there are no last words here. And so for me, I think, again, it's about that kind of world making, that now that we've had this conversation, you'll have other conversations and it's gonna carry on. And so that's what I'm excited about.